Good afternoon and welcome to the Subcommittee on Planning Dispositions and Concessions. I'm Councilmember Chaim Daish and I will be chairing today's hearing. As Chair Kalos cannot be here today, he's still on paternity leave. We are joined today by Council Members Ruben Diaz and Council Member Rafael Samanca. Uh, thank you. Today we'll be holding a public hearing on the Spafford Campus for Development Applications and Land Use Chair Members Salamanca's District in the Bronx, EDC, uh, DCAS, and developer the Peninsula, the Peninsula is JB LLC seek approval for five related actions. One, disposition of city-owned property by ground lease. Two, a zoning map amendment to rezone an R6 district to a M1-2 slash R7-2, MX-17. Special mixed use district. Three, a zoning text amendment to establish the special mixed use district. Map the project area as a mandatory inclusionary housing area utilizing option one and enable CPC to issue a special permit to waive loading birth requirements for this site. For a large-scale general uh, development special permit to modify loading birth requirements, and five, a large-scale general development special permit to modify height and setback regulations. These actions would facilitate the, re re the redevelopment of the former spa for juvenile detention center into a five-building mixed-use project with approximately 740 units of affordable housing and light industrial commercial and community facility uses in Hunts Point neighborhood of Community District 2 in the Bronx. I will now open the public hearing on the five pre-considered LUs related to the Spafford Campus redevelopment. Uh, I'd like to call up uh, Ariana Sachs Rosenberg, Charlie Samboy, Is Ismini Spiliotis, uh, I'd like to ask uh, Council to administer the oath. <laughs> Please state your names into the microphones. Uh, Charlie Samboy. Ariana Sachs Rosenberg. Ismini Spiliotis. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before the subcommittee and in response to all council member questions? I do. I do. I do. Okay. Um, first, I'd like to call up uh, my colleague, uh, Rafael Samanka. Before I do that, I just will congratulate um, my colleague. He was listed today on City and State of New York City's top 100 of most powerful people in the city of New York. So give a nice round of applause. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just, you know, one, uh, put it in public record. This is a project that I've been working on uh, in, my, uh, in my capacity, both as a district manager and as a council member for, I would say, four to five years now. Um, it's a really exciting time in the Bronx uh, this used to be a jail for over 50 years in the, in the South Bronx, in the Hunts Point community. Um, this jail was closed in, the, mm, I would say, 2011. And since then, you know, it's, it's just been an eyesore in the community. And it's refreshing to know that the city came back and um, they, they did an RFP. And the individuals that were awarded this RFP uh, were local not-for-profits in the community. Uh, local not-for-profits in which the community has confidence in, and um, CBOs in which work hand-in-hand hand with local elected officials and provide uh, a great service uh, to the local community. Um, it's The project is not perfect. I do have concerns. I do have acts, and I'm going to continue to push the envelope, uh, but um, I'm, I'm, I'm excited about this project, and with that, I'll let them uh, make their presentation. We're joined by Council Member Andy King, and we could uh, begin the panel. Great. Uh, good, good afternoon, Council Members. Um, thank you so much for having us here today. Um, my name is Charlie Samboy. I am Assistant Vice President for Government and Community Relations at the New York City Economic Development Corporation, where uh, in my capacity I oversee uh, all of EDC's projects in the Bronx and in Upper Manhattan. Uh, I'm joined today by my colleagues from uh, NYC EDC's real estate team, 
uh, Susan Goldfinger and Diana Clement, as well as several representatives from the Peninsula LLC, as well as members from our planning team uh, who can be made available for questions. Uh, the redevelopment of the Spofford Juvenile Detention Facility in Hunts Point, section of the Bronx, is a deep, deeply meaningful project for local Hunts Point residents, uh, NYC, EDC, and the de Blasio administration. Uh, opened in 1957, the detention center once housed uh, approximately 280 youth. The center was uh, experienced operational challenges, and after 50 years, the facility closed in 2011. Uh, consistent with the city's goal to transition to a community-based uh, juvenile deten juvenile model. Since 2011, the site has remained vacant, uh, but now NYC EDC and our partners will help cr write a, a new chapter of the site's history, one that marks a new era for Hunts Point. In 2014, EDC identified Spofford as a pivotal site for helping to advance the, administra the administration's plan to now create and preserve uh, 300,000 homes. Since early 2015, EDC collaborated with uh, Bronx Borough President Diaz, Council Members Salamanca, Bronx Com Community Board 2, local community organizations and stakeholders to identify ways to best activate and create these much needed housing units. And of course, we saw input from the local community. Throughout 2015, we conducted a number of visioning sessions, including a public meeting that was attended by over 100 residents, and we held a roundtable with over a dozen local community leaders and community-based organizations. It was our top priority to make sure that the community felt heard and that their feedback was, was reflected in the new plan for development. Today, after, 50, after years of listening and planning, EDC is proud to present The Peninsula, a redevelopment plan for Spofford that reflects the needs of the greater community and propels the site into the 21st century. The Peninsula was developed by Gilbane Development, Hudson Companies, and Mutual Housing Association of New York. This mixed-use project will create over 700 affordable homes, more than 100,000 square feet of industrial, community, and commercial facility spaces, and over 50,000 square feet of publicly accessible open space, and an early learning facility managed by the Administration for Children's Services. The former facility will be completely demolished, uh, officially ending a dark chapter of the city and community's history with this site. The peninsula represents a significant investment in the Hunts Point community, it will create hundreds of permanent and construction jobs and provide much needed community services. Throughout, sorry, through Higher NYC, we will ensure that local residents have access to job opportunities here. And with a 35% MWBE contracting goal, we are advancing our commitment to help grow and sustain these businesses. Uh, both of these programs work together to help build a more equitable and fair city. Throughout this process, EDC has engaged uh, Community Board 2 and members of the Hunts Point and Longwood communities. We have provided updates on applying for the development's affordable housing lottery, and we have continued to seek input on how we can best integrate this project into the broader neighborhood. Today, we ask the City Council to support this transformative mixed-use project. EDC perhaps has never had a better opportunity to create such a good, such a good project on such a blighted site. We know that this investment will better not just home Hunts Point, but the entire borough of the Bronx. If we can, it is also our desire to, for this to serve as a model of effective urban planning for decades to come, proving that it is never too late for a place to reinvent itself. Uh, I will now introduce uh, Ariana Sox Goldingerberg, director at Hudson Companies, uh, who will now share more details on this groundbreaking project. Um, thank you for your attention, and myself and my colleagues will be available should you have any questions at the end of this panel. Thank you. We would like to thank the committee for allowing us to present today. We're excited to hear your thoughts. We'd like to thank Acting Chair Deutsch for allowing us some time with you this past week to talk with us and share your thoughts on the project. We'd especially like to thank Chair Salamanca for his insight and availability throughout this process. We believe the project is better because of the numerous conversations we've had with your office and your staff, and we appreciate your time and your team's commitment to the project and we look forward to continuing to work with you. I'm Ariana Sachs Rosenberg, a director at the Hudson Companies. I'm joined today with our joint venture partners, Ismini Spiliotis, the executive director of Manny Management Inc., who is joining me to present with to you, and Gilbane Development Company, who's in the audience today. Together, the partners have developed over 14,000 units of housing and 5,000 units of affordable housing. 
We also have representatives today from the Point CDC and Urban Health Plan, two local community partners that have, have been essential in helping us shape this project into what you see today. Both of these community partners will be taking non-residential spaces in the future development to provide an expansion to their already existing services in the Hunts Point area. We are extremely grateful and honored, to, honored for our project and team to be selected by the city. And we have been diligently collaborating with the incredible and dedicated staff of BDC, HPD, DCP, PDC, CB2, and other community and city agencies over the past year and a half to refine and improve the development plans we present to you. Most importantly, I'd like to say that we really, truly love this project and we're excited to be here to present it to you. We like to say this project is really by the Bronx, for the Bronx, of the Bronx. On the screen in front of you, you'll see a site plan of the existing facility. Um, the facility is circled, outlined in, in red, um, which includes the former site of the Spotsburg Juvenile Detention Center, um, a vacant lot, and the existing ACS facility. Adjacent to the property to the north is the Corpus Christi Monastery, um, ball fields, and the Hunts Point Recreation Center. In addition, about a block away is the banknote building um, and an old structure that was rehabilitated into a great light industrial um, building. Additionally, you'll notice that there's residential spaces to the east and south of the site. And then what makes the site really interesting, and I think we've really done a great job of tying the project into um, the existing community to the west is the um, uh, light industrial industrial spaces. So this rendering is a bird's eye perspective um, seen basically um, from the bottom of the site looking up of the proposed project. Um, this includes all five buildings of the new development site. You're basically looking at a bird's eye view from the corner of um, Spofford Avenue and Tiffany, and you're looking at the five buildings. The first two buildings here in the foreground, the lower building is what we refer to as Building 1A. Um, it's the light industrial building, um, really the job generator for the site. It's part of phase one. And Building 1B, a residential building with um, non-residential use of the base. Additionally, you'll see behind it, moving from um, west to east across the site, uh, phase two, which includes buildings 2A and 2B, and then phase three over here, which is at the corner of Spofford and Manita Street, which is building three. So some impo important highlights um, about the land use and zoning actions. Um, we'll be changing the parcels, um, or we are planning to change the parcels from an R6 to an M12 slash R7-2 special mixed-use district. Um, the ULERP actions include a large-scale general development with modifications to height and setback, minimum distance between buildings and modifications of the rear yard regulations. At the bottom of this slide, you will find the ULERP application numbers. Um, this is a, a detailed slide with a lot of information about the EIS. In the EIS, we had two notes, um, two imp impacts of note that we'd like to share with you, kind of highlights here. One was for transportation and the other was for construction noise. The main highlights are that there will be a signal required to be installed on the corner of Spofford and Tiffany. This is basically the southwest corner of the site that you saw the bird's eye perspective taken from. And then during demolition, there will be a 12-foot fence with insulation um, surrounding the entire site. This will further alleviate noise and dust in addition to um, scheduled washdowns and all of the other requirements. So a bit about the project. The project mission is really based around two core concepts. One is empowering Bronx businesses, and the second is to provide affordable housing for Bronx residents. Our goal is to bring homegrown food manufacturing, technology, media production, and commercial retail uses that spring from growing sectors in the, Bronx, in the South Bronx economy and create high quality, living wage, and career oriented jobs.
The project is expected to have $300 million in plus development, total development costs invested in the project. We have a 35% MWBE target. This means about $105 million minimum is going to MWBE businesses, either in design, demolition, or construction contracts. Working with proven local hiring programs, including Urban Health Plan, Bronx Works, Works and Sustainable South Bronx, we will be training and recruiting people to come to the site. We're actively working with the CB2 Veterans Committee, including meeting with Don D. McKellar and city and state local organization, city and state organizations to engage veterans in job opportunities. Don D. has connected us with the New York State Department of Labor as well. Additionally, we intend on having local hiring coordinators in the field to make the pipeline of jobs and connecting employees to employers seamless. I'm going to pass it over to Ismini now. So, <coughs> thanks, Ariana. Um, so I'm one of the co-developers, the executive director at Manny, and I wanted to walk us through both um, the uses at Building 1A, the commercial light industrial building, and then um, get into the housing and the residential units in Building 1B and the rest of the site. So this is a very critical, um, this is, as, as Ariana said, we're very excited about this one particular building because it actually connects um, the uh, industrial na uh, uses at Hunts Point and, and, and Hunts Point is known for its industrial uses and then actually ties it and, 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 and kind of very organically um, moves us into the residential neighborhood. Uh, what we've done in Building 1A, it's a two-story building uh, it, we've designed it in a manner that looks industrial, purposefully, um, and we're bringing over 120,000 square feet um, of both uh, light industrial, commercial, and then open space, which Ariana will talk with you later, um, a little bit more detail. Um, this particular building is about 50,000 square feet, and as I said, two stories, and we are... Um, uh, planning, we have commitments from and are planning to fill it with um, businesses that are currently in the Bronx that are looking to enlarge their space and enlarge their business um, footprint. Um, more than half of the um, businesses that we are talking and working with are M and WBE Bronx based entities. Um, we also um, have been working very, very hard to um, develop, program, and design space that we know is a critical of critical importance both to the council person, um, the community board, and the community at large, which is um, uh, kitchen accelerator spaces. Actually, and let me back up um, before we talk about the kitchen accelerator spaces um, so I can be a little bit more specific. Not only is Hunts Point known as a kind of an industrial place, it also has a reputation with the Hunts Point market as a food, um, as a place for the food industry with the, with the, uh, with the Hunts Point uh, food market. And so we actually took that uh, theme, not only during our planning sessions, um, community residents identify that way also, um, but there really are businesses there that needed to grow and find additional space. So our current uh, relationships are with two uh, Hunts Point-based uh, um, companies, one, Bascom Catering, that currently caters and, uh, and has a little cafe and operates out of a very small space at the Point, one of our community partners, and is in desperate need of expansion space. And the second is a bakery, um, bread baking uh, facility called Il Forno that actually um, uh, bakes bread and has it delivered all over the city and has a, an enormous opportunity for growth and increasing its market share, um, both in bread and possibly other types of baked goods. Our third partner that's already been identified is um, two brothers, the Ramirez brothers, that are well known to this community that run a, um, a brew uh, hall out of a small space um, at the Bronx um, Market on Arthur Avenue. And they um, have committed to expanding and creating a brew pub facility uh, within Building 1A. 
going back to or go, uh, you know uh, con continuing with the spaces that have not yet been programmed we are extremely uh, cognizant of the need for some type of incubator slash accelerator spaces for food businesses and we know that this is of, of, of deep interest and concern to to the councilman and uh, the community board and residents and we have identified um, we've been um, identified a couple of ideas, including working with the Hostos uh, Culinary Arts Continuing Education Program, um, and working together with Bascom Catering to to consider this along with other uh, opportunities. Um, so we this is early on, and so we're hoping that through conversations with the councilman and the community board, um, these ideas will become much much more uh, clear and uh, clearly more developed as we as we pursue uh, the actual users of the space um, we are, our projections currently uh, uh, for construction jobs are somewhere between uh, 1,000 and 1,200 and uh, then we are we, we believe that we will be able to generate 300 to about 375 permanent jobs and that would be both as part of the residential and management work and the um, business manufacturing and commercial um, in all three that's as a result of the development at the end of all three phases the second key um, aspect of this project the four of the five buildings are residential as Ariana said there are going to be some community facility and commercial uses on the ground floor and uh, and and the second floor in 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 some parts of the building but um, those will be in um, uh, some of that will, will be in buildings uh, in the second phase, and she will talk more to that. The housing, as both Charlie from EDC mentioned and Ariana mentioned, the total site is projected to generate 740 affordable apartments. What we mean by affordable, you can see on this, on this, on this chart. We are proposing seven uh, 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 um, income categories, which are six of which are um, from 30% of area median income up to 90% of area median income. And so you'll see that in each building, uh, there will actually be uh, studios, one bedrooms, two bedrooms, three bedrooms, and in a future building, there will be four bedroom apartments, um, and they will range uh, from 30% to 90% of area median income with a 10% set aside for formerly homeless families as per the current HPD term sheets. I think we've been working really, really closely um, with the community board and the councilman on the housing. Um, housing is a need not only throughout New York City, but in this neighborhood as well. This is one of the poorest com um, community boards in the entire city, and our goal here was to actually build a build buildings where the current residents of Community Board 2 and Hunts Point would actually be eligible for um, people who are overcrowded and currently rent burdened would have an opportunity to actually apply and live in these buildings. Um, so we have in, 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 in advance and in an effort to realize this commitment of ours and to um, really actualize the city's commitment to a 50% community preference, we have started working with the community board and with the councilmen on um, uh, seminars to really make sure that the community residents know about the Peninsula Project and know how to apply for the housing, whether it's this project or ones that come available before that. And in this particular project, as I think folks know, 50% of the apartments will go to residents of Community Board 2 prior to any units going to other um, other other applicants in the in the housing lottery, um, and I'm sorry, Rafael, uh, Ralph Acevedo from Community Board Two couldn't be here with us today, but he asked me to send his regards and um, and the community board's um, regards uh, um, with regard to this project. I think um, the last thing I'll say before we go back to the um, rest of the development is that we um, uh, that we want. Uh, you all to know that we are building housing affordable to very low, low and moderate income people, but um, the building will be absolutely beautiful and it will come with a wide array of amenities. Um, there will be dishwashers in every apartment. 
there will be hardwood floors, there will be a community space, there will be uh, a uh, meeting space, there will be a gym, uh, there will be a central uh, washer and dryer laundry room that opens up into the um, open space. Um, there will be a children's playroom uh, that will also be available and near to the laundry facility. There will be bike storage room access, uh, refuse and trash and recycling chutes on every floor to really make uh, recycling and um, garbage uh, maintenance uh, uh, as easy as possible for our residents. And there is a huge number of sustainable um, aspects to this project that will not only benefit the owner and the environment, but will actually be passed down and through the residents of the building. And parking, sorry, and uh, clearly a, a, a key element. So there actually is parking in this project, not in phase one, um, but uh, by the end of the project, there will be 260 uh, par um, parking spaces available for the project and the community. So on the screen, you can see the site plan. Um, just walking you through the site, um, moving um, from west to east. Um, and just kind of to explain the site a bit more, that site actually has a, a really steep elevation change. So you're moving from Tiffany Street to Manita, and it's about a 40-foot um, change in elevation um, between the ground floor of build the buildings in phase one, um, buildings 1A and 1B, and building three, which is uh, phase three of the project. Um, what I'd like to highlight here is the um, is the um, the extension of Barreto Street, basically a p private driveway that will um, enter the site and open onto Building 2A, so that the building has um, FDNY fire access. Additionally, we have um, a lot of public open space, which I'll be um, talking about. So this, um, this slide breaks up the project into the different phases. So the first phase of the project, again, is buildings 1A and 1B, 1A being the major job generator, um, and building 1B having uh, about 183 units of affordable housing with ground floor and second floor community facility and retail uses. Um, phase two includes buildings 2A and 2B. Building 2B will have um, one of the two underground parking lots in it. Building 2A will have the community facility space um, where the existing um, ACS facility um, will be provided a new AP ACS facility and actually an expanded ACS facility. It will be about 15,000 square feet interior and 5,000 square feet um, private space exterior. Um, and phase three includes um, building three and some adjacent open space and then an offsite open space, which I'll speak about further. It also includes the remaining um, underground parking lot. So um, a bit about the open space plan. There's a little over 54,000 square feet of open space required as part of the development, which is memorialized in the restrictive declaration for the property. Um, it was critical to CPC that a certain amount of public open space be delivered in each phase of the development. Therefore, the development team has committed to providing open space in each phase of the development. Each of the color figures is associated with an open space that would be delivered as part of the ex publicly accessible open space as associated with the TCO of that building. The open spaces are associated with the building tax lot boundaries. Each building will be on its own tax lot and have a closing for each, each building. <clears throat> the agreement is for the, uh, the ground leases, we should say, is the agreement is that the closing will be for a ground lease on each of the properties and that it will be a 49-year ground lease per building with, an ex uh, with the city extendable to 99, year, 99 years based on our performance milestones as agreed to with EDC. Additionally, as part of the project, the development team is delivering a little over 14,000 square feet of graded, grassed, fenced area to the Department of Parks and Recreation for them to do as they choose as part of phase three of the development. As you can see, this is the green area adjacent to building three, uh, building three's open space, and this will be delivered as part of phase three of the project. This property, when complete, will be given back to parks jurisdiction. Um, 
So this is a security, uh, security site plan. Um, we're just showing here kind of a minimum number of cameras that would be on the exterior. There will, of course, be cameras on the interior of the buildings as well. Video recordings will be saved for a minimum of 30 days and will be available to the 41st Precinct. The development team has already met with the 41st Precinct to discuss the future plans for the project and access to video recordings. There will be places for fence posts in the future if we wish to in incorporate them and find them necessary. So I really love these drawings. They're, um, they're axos of the site moving up moving up the property. And what's what's really important and we want to stress is that um, the site is really interesting because you really move um, and change in elevation. And so we and the design team have really been working to make that site um, work to our advantage and how can we incorporate that into the different space planning aspects of the site. So here, um, this is the ground floor of phase one. You can see the light industrial, the ground floor of the light industrial building as well as the community facility and retail uses on um, the ground floor of the um, building 1B as part of phase one. What's interesting about that is that you'll also see the, uh, the basement floor of the parking of um, building 2B as part of phase two. Moving up, um, you'll see the uh, the large plaza in the center and the second floor of 1A and 1B as well as the first floors of the um, second phase and then the parking of the third phase. So we're really trying to work with the grid again and um, use that to our advantage. Finally, you'll see um, the the first floor of phase three which in includes urban health plan and a grocery store at the corner of Menina and Spofford. So some renderings for you to look at. Um, this is a view from Tiffany Street and Spofford Avenue. Um, so it's basically um, the uh, overview uh, rendering that we showed you previously coming down to grade level and looking up at the site. And you can really start to see the grade level change um, along Spofford here. In the foreground, you'll see the um, Building 1A, the light industrial building, as well as um, Building 1B. So these two buildings together comprise phase one of the project. This view is taken from Tiffany Street. It's looking at um, the um, public access way or um, central corridor that, that connects the east-west con corridor that connects um, Manita Street to Tiffany Street. So you're, look, you're standing basically on the western edge of Tiffany Street looking, um, looking up, looking east. Um, and so you'll see building 1B to the left and building 1A to the right with um, building to be in the background. This is a view of the central plaza looking southeast. The large building here is building 2B, and this building on the right is building 1A. So we have a lot of um, active, passive, uh, public open space for people to enjoy. We plan on programming that space, working with the local community groups, um, as well as the development team has experience in programming spaces like this. So we're really excited to bring a space like this to the community. Um, this um, image is on Spofford Avenue. It's looking across the street um, towards building 1A on the left. In the background is building 1B. And on the right-hand side, over here, you'll see the ground floor um, community facility space um, that the point would be in, um, in building 2B and in the background building 2A. This image looks down Spofford Avenue. Um, it actually doesn't maybe do the views ju justice here. You can actually, from this vantage point, um, even on the second floor of a lot of these buildings, you have amazing views of um, Manhattan and the skyline. Um, but here you can see looking down this street at the corner of Spofford and Menida, there, this is where the grocery store will be planned. Um, adjacent to that is the space for urban health plan. And this is building, um, building three. You can also see contextually the buildings um, that exist uh, at the site currently across the street, the residential buildings. 
And finally, this, um, this rendering is a view from Menida Street. Um, what we wanted to show here is just how the buildings themselves are incorporated and really work with the existing context. So you'll see um, the existing uh, buildings that are at the property now on the, on the left-hand side, and then you'll see the ball field across with the Hunts Point Recreation Center, and then buildings 3, 2A, and 2B in the background. And I think that's the end of our presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, first of all, we're joined by uh, Council Member Vanessa Gibson. Uh, thank you for joining us. Um, and I have I have a few questions. Uh, so, what is the what is the um, utilization rate and capacity uh, at the local schools uh, in Hunts Point? And secondly, uh, what about the charter school capacity? If you can answer these two. So we can have a member of our uh, either planning or real estate team answer that in the next panel. Uh, but I could. Okay. Um, but what we can say from the outset is that the it was not found to be a uh, significant adverse impact for schools. Um, additionally, the seeker methodology does not account for um, charter schools uh, when it when it looks at seats um, utilized within a, a particular district. And what we know is that in, in Hunts Point, there's a number of uh, charter schools that, that take up a significant number, several hundred seats in that district. Um, we could have uh, a member of our team in the next panel answer that question uh, more acutely. Um, but at this moment, we don't have a significant adverse impact on school seats. OK, um, thank you. Uh, I understand that 10% uh, of the development you set aside for um, people who are formerly homeless. Um, what is, um, what about the veterans, homeless veterans? Right, let me just wear you on. Uh, please state your name. Jordan Press, I'm Executive Director for Planning and Development at HPD. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and you'll answer the council members' questions truthfully? I do. Um, so uh, HPD's uh, ELLA program, which this building is being developed under, uh, as well as our mix and match program, require a 10% uh, set aside for um, formerly homeless uh, individuals or families. Uh, we don't have any such set aside for veterans in our program. We're currently um, uh, doing a disparity study, which would be required um, to make sure that we don't run afoul of any fair housing laws um, to, to explore whether um, set asides for, for veterans only could be, um, could be accommodated. Um, there, there is a prevalence of veterans in the homeless system, unfortunately. Um, we, when, we, when we pull individuals from the homeless system, they don't uh, specifically ask them if they're veterans or not into, into these units. Um, I think that's about the information that I have for you on that. So, oh, so what's the difference uh, if you target homeless or veterans when it comes to the Fair Housing right. Act? So, um, the, the reason that a disparity study is needed um, is to make sure that if we were to uh, do a set aside that we are not having any kind of disparate impact on one, uh, for instance, one race or another. So for example, just an example, if let's say veterans were 90% uh, Caucasian in the city and we were to then do a set aside for veterans, we would be setting aside a percentage that were that that was higher than what the um, you know general racial makeup of the city is and there would be an impact we want to make sure that we're not having any kind of impact like that so we, so we need to um, we, we need to study that and look into it okay I mean I think we need to look look into the to the long into the big picture and you know, also the long run that when it comes to um, uh, developments across the city, especially when it comes to affordable housing, that we need to take in, um, into consideration uh, 
that our veterans are the reason why we're here today. And uh, if not for our veterans, this project probably not being, we wouldn't be sitting here talking about this project. Um, so we need to take really take into consideration, look and check with council to see how we could integrate the veterans with homeless because the homeless we also don't know um, could be all be from the same group, you know, undocumented homeless, yeah, could be all from the same same country. Who knows? We we do have set aside programs where the funding stream is specifically for homeless veterans. It's called the VASH program. It's a uh, a HUD and Veterans Administration joint program um, for VA supportive housing. And under that, um, the federal funding stream is specifically for homeless veterans with service needs. Um, this is not this is not, not funded with VASH. Um. Yeah, I, I understand that. So I, again, I just want to reiterate the saying that uh, there is a streamline of funding for veterans uh, in support of housing, but the R3 homeless shelters, veteran homeless shelters across the city, and I would love to see them going to regular um, living spaces, uh, not, not shelters, and they, should all, they all deserve to come out of shelters, go into regular housing, so we need to look in the next projects uh, moving forward to, s to make sure that we have set aside um, for, for our veterans. Um, all right, uh, I'd like to, um, I think uh, Council Member Rafael Samanka has a question. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Price, how are you, sir? Um, just uh, one, uh, something that I did not speak about in, um, in my opening statements was about the housing forms that I'm working with Manning Management and how excited I am for that and something that I would love to uh, share with my colleagues uh, is the fact that we're putting together what's called housing forums. And one of the main concerns when you have this amount of development coming into your district so concerns of the community that they do not have access to these units. And um, the reason they feel that way is a lot of times they don't know how to properly apply on Housing Connects, or when they do apply, there's, there's barriers that are affecting them from actually getting access to these units. So um, in conjunction with Manning Management and really part members of this project in my office, we put together what's called housing forms where residents of the community come in, they get to apply online on um, Housing Connects, uh, they get some type of financial literacy. Uh, they leave with a copy of their credit report. And they also leave with a list of the, the um, housing units that are coming up along that immediate community with the date that applications will start, they will start taking applications just to give residents in that community a head start and preparing them so that they can qualify for these units. Now, um, in terms of the food incubator, um, I know you spoke on it briefly. Uh, this this was one of my asks that this is going to be a reality, where there's going to be a a, a a kitchen for startup businesses to come in, startup uh, you know business owners in terms of restaurants to come in and test their products. Um, they can go into it in a bit, but we are we are continuing to investigate that. The uh, development team has hired a number of consultants that have worked on successful projects in other uh, areas, particularly in the Pfizer building in Brooklyn. Um, but we are looking at several models across the city to see which would be the most appropriate, um, and they can expand a bit on that here. Um, yes, uh, as, as Charlie said, so we actually um, have taken that to heart, Councilman, and um, reached out to a consultant, uh, Karen Carp and Partners, and they actually have expertise with incubator spaces, uh, start, you know, specialty in consulting for the growth of small food businesses. And so we actually um, are, have started to work with them, and they're doing two major things. They're doing many things, but two major things. is One is working with the folks I did that have been identified so far, Bascom and Il Forno and the brewery, to help these folks prepare a business plan, funding, um, understand what their layout requirements are so we can actually make them successful since they kind of came on first. There is actually additional space in the building um, and I think right now we have uh, approximately three other spaces that we are working to program whether it's through Hostos or um, for this incubator accelerator space that you are mentioning. So we would very much like to sit down and, um, and, and make sure that we are kind of in sync with where we're going and with what your desire is. All right, awesome. I just want to make sure that 
before we vote on that, that's part of the committee. No, uh, what I would say is I think it's it would be it would be important for us to continue that dialogue, and I think maybe deep al dig, dig a little bit deeper into what you envision when you when you say incubator or because I think we want to get it right. Okay. We want to make sure that we're not making assumptions on what you're requesting. All right, um, La Peninsula has start. Yes, it's it's. I know that they have a building there as part of this project. You're going to create a new facility, a new building for them. The peninsula is dear to the hearts of the Hunts Point community. And to mine, you know, I went to a peninsula head start, not in this particular location, but when I was a child in the South Bronx. Mm -hmm. They've been in the community for over 50 years at this specific location. Um, my concern is that they, I want, I would like to see them build out their own space as part of this project. But I know that their contract will be up for renewal sometime in 2020. Mm -hmm. um, this is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. You, you never really get to build your own space. I want to make sure that they get that opportunity. How are we going to make that a reality with this project? Uh, so one of the commitments that the uh, – well, actually, one of the responsibilities that the development team has to the city is to provide a space of approximately, I think, uh, 15,000 square feet, which is uh, significantly larger than the existing facility today. And what we are, what they are committed to doing is, is providing that space for the community in advance of uh, disrupting any activity on the existing location for ACS Head Start. So at no time will there be any, any interruption of services. With respect to the specific provider having input into the, the space, what it looks like and its fit out, that's a conversation that we can continue to have with ACS, uh, with your office and with DOE. Um, what we know is that they will still be operating while that space is being fit out. So um, we hope to have more clarity uh, on who the provider will be when that f when we get to that phase of the project. But what we know today is that uh, La Peninsula will continue to be the provider through the opening of, of phase two. So Charlie, we had me we had meetings months ago, and I got the same answer. Mm -hmm. And they told me that they were going to follow up, and that's not a clear answer. Okay. I want to see the peninsula retrofit their own space okay and that's that's one of my main acts okay important to me and it's important to the Hunts Point community okay. we'll certainly have an answer before the end of this process um, the hiring of unionized of unionized workers for demolition and construction is that something that will be feasible as part of this project um, so yes uh, in fact the um, so the project will be built in phases, and that includes actually the uh, asbestos and demolition removal is kind of almost the pre-phase. And uh, we went out and we bid it to Bronx-based union and non-union contractors, and um, ultimately have selected a uh, women-owned uh, uh, business that is a union shop. Uh, and so and we've been working with them to uh, not only uh, knowing that their union shop that they'll be doing, you know, according to their union rules, but also then looking in terms of what they'll be able to hire um, as part of, th of the demo phase, which is not a huge number of people. Um, but again, whatever they're doing, that it'll be a progression um, with them. So that's where we are right now. And our commitment is to do the same um, on, um, on, the, on, on the construction site, which is really try to uh, balance a um, a union, non-union, and Bronx-based women-owned business uh, and minority-owned business uh, balance of contractors. All right. Uh, what about the hiring of unionized workers for building maintenance jobs? Um, yes. Yeah, so uh, as you know, Manny um, is, uh, is an owner and manager, and all of our supers are actually union. Um, and in this particular case, in the Bronx, our supers are 32BJ. And in this case, also, we've made a commitment and actually signed up a pre-agreement um, that, um, that, the, that, the, that the maintenance workers here will be 32BJ. All right. How many uh, maintenance worker jobs do you anticipate will be created out of this project once completed? Is that I, so it's four resident supers. There'll be one resident superintendent on each building, and then there'll be an, an additional, uh, I don't know, somewhere between six and ten additional porters and handymen on the site, and they'll be responsible for helping clean, uh, uh, um, 
uh, grounds workers, and internal and uh, grounds workers, as well as um, handymen, which will be supporting the supers on repairs. So 10, 10, 10 workers in total? 10 to 15. It'll, it'll probably be 10 to 15, okay, because of the four plus. Yeah, yeah. okay. Um, I had an interesting conversation with Labor last week, specifically on this project. Is there a way that there can be training I would like to see these jobs go to local residents, residents that live in that community board. Um, is there a way that there can be a training provided for local residents so that they can have access to these jobs and you know, when these jobs are, are available, they'll be the first ones who have access to them and will be able to enter into labor? Um, I, it's a great question, and actually, we uh, um, I just uh, lost a super on a building right across the street, and um, so we actually reached out to the Bronx Exchange, and we're actually working with Bronx Exchange right now to see who they have, but I think we could actually, Councilman, I think we could actually do something very similar to what we're doing on the housing, and also because we're going to be doing the outreach on the jobs, both for, you know, during construction, is use that as an opportunity to um, identify folks either, remember the construction jobs are often temporary. And so the idea of selecting some folks who might ha make it through the process through the temporary construction jobs and then be eligible because they've gotten some basic training and want to stay with the project, move them into training and long-term employment with, um, with, the, with, the, with the LLC um, is, is, uh, is, is our idea, our thought, and I think fits with yours. But I think in addition to that, um, in order to be successful, there's lots of people who want the jobs but don't have the right training. So working both through that, constru that construction mechanism and through 32BJ to, to train, to train um, folks for, 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 for these jobs. We will, we will absolutely be happy to work on that. All right. Um, I had a conversation with the local community board about their community benefits um, requests or community benefits agreements. Um, they mentioned that they would like to see some type of investment in the Hunts Point Recreation Center and also some type of investment in the, um, the preservation of the Hunts Point Slave Burial Ground at Drake Park. Um, I don't have specific requests. Maybe this is something that we can talk offline unless something comes up. Uh, but, but again, this is something that I like to see as part of this package and as part of the commitment letter. We would be more than happy to talk about it um, with you, Councilman. Um, we're, as you as you saw in the presentation, we're um, and this has been a, a tough negotiation in terms of what we're giving um, back to the parks, to Department of Parks in terms of that fourteen thousand square feet. Um, so that's one thing that we are doing. Um, uh, we've actually been by the Hunts Point burial ground, and we 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 you know, and we know that PS forty eight you know works with them. So understanding what is needed there or what works there um, is something we would be more than happy to discuss with you um, and and so we can make that happen all right yeah um, I, I think piggybacking off that we're, we're happy to have conversations to see in which ways we can integrate um, the rec center into what's happening at this site as well as to what ways we can we can discuss uh, integration with the burial site um, specific to the recommendation that came out of the community board I think there were some financial requests that came out of that uh, recommendation, and I think that's something we have to look at very closely, given all the other constraints on the on the site and the finances. On Tiffany Street, uh, from Spofford to Lafayette, we have issues now. Number one, the sidewalks are in bad repair. Um, I know that half of that block on Tiffany Street belongs to the monastery that's there. Um, lighting's extremely bad. We're having issues with prostitution as we speak. Uh, illegal uh, truck parking as we speak and so uh, you know there's major concerns in that that particular block now and when this project is completed um, first I would like to see that entire sidewalk be redone and there, there needs to be, and, and, and we can have this conversation offline, but again, before it, we're vote, it's voted on, I want a part of the commitment letter, that there's going to be adequate lighting during the construction phase, and that there's going to be adequate lighting added to the entire block of Tiffany Street 
from Spofford to Lafayette, even on the monastery side. And I need help in terms of enforcement from EDC and HPD and the local not-for-profits on addressing the illegal truck parking that's happening there now. Um, these are all great recommendations. I think, in particular, I think this highlights the need for us to move quickly on this site because, you know, given that it's been vacant, um, there's a lot of uh, vacancy happening, and we know that um, once this project is complete and once construction begins, there's going to be a lot of activity, residents, workers, a lot of eyes on the street. So we know that um, specific to the site from the monastery south, there's going to be new activity going on. We will certainly be happy to work with you and our partners at DOT to address some of the concerns on the uh, north side of Tiffany from the monastery to Lafayette. All right. Um, and then as part of this project, I know that 100% of these units will remain af are affordable. For how long will they remain affordable? So I think per MIH, a percentage of them will be permanently affordable. Um, with respect to the balance of that, I'll let one of my colleagues answer. Yeah, I mean, I think we haven't finished the, um, we haven't negotiated the regulatory agreement yet, um, Councilman. But as, as Charlie said, so a minimum of 25% of the units, as per MIH, will be permanently affordable. Um, uh, I think that uh, you have, Hudson and Gilbane and Manny have me as part of the development team. So you're, you know, going to be um, part of my job is to, you know, carry that that flag in terms of affordability. The buildings are rent stabilized. Uh, we expect to be an, an extended use agreement with HPD in, and HDC in terms of a regulatory period. So I don't know. I I think the minimum would be 40 years, but I think we, you know, I think we really have to look at it. We have to look at the financing. We're not quite there yet. But I would, I guess, at the risk of um, overspeaking, I mean, as long as, as you know, we, we plan to, to keep these units affordable for as long as absolutely, I mean, Yeah, so possible. again, um, the, my, my concern is permanent affordability. I think 25% is a little too low, and I would like to negotiate that with you. And in terms of the 40-year time period, I'm looking at more as 60 years. Um, again, this is me pushing the envelope. That's great. We will absolutely um, circle back with you. All right. And then finally, surveillance cameras will be added to this um, to this project. Uh, is there a way that we can add exterior surveillance cameras during construction? Again, this is a very isolated area. There's been issues, vandalism, prostitution. Quality of life is a major concern of ours in this community. Yes, yeah, so we, we would be happy to explore that. I think right now they are providing fencing that is above and beyond what's required. Um, and I think we all share in an interest uh, to make sure that this site is secure from demolition through construction and, and obviously once residents are living in it. So we'd be happy to explore that. Thank you. And again, I just want to reiterate how rewarding it is to know that there's local not-for-profits who really care about, this, care about this piece of land that are part owners of this project. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Wow, great questions. Um, which you have asked us, Mika Legal. Um, so any other questions? No? All right, uh, I guess this panel is dismissed. Uh, thank you very much, Councilman. Yeah. Go for lunch. Yeah. A little late for lunch, almost um, dinner. Councilman, do you, yes. would, would you like Bill Habib, our consultant, to come back and answer the school question for you in uh, a yes, bit more yeah. detail? Yeah. Great. Uh, w yeah, thank you. Um, we have another panel. I'd like to call up Maria Torres. Come on down. Uh, I'd like to ask uh, Council to administer the oath. We don't usually do it. Oh, we don't do it? Okay. Yeah. She's not here, sorry. Sorry? Just give me my... Hi, go ahead. Okay, there you go, sorry. I have some written comments, but first I just had some off-the-cuff things I would like to say. Well, first, I want to thank Councilman Salamanca for his uh, diligence and his questions. They're great. Um, it shows a council person and, and someone who knows his community and the needs and the wants. So I, even though he's grilling our group, I appreciate it as, a, as, a, as who I am. So I thank you for that. Um, 
And then I would li just like to say, um, I, I'm here before you as a representative of the Point CDC, which is um, one of the nonprofits that is a community partner for this project. But I also, um, I also wear a few other hats in that community. And I've been a resident of Hunts Point, Menida Street for 23 years. I've raised two sons in that community. Uh, I'm very familiar with the area and all the residents and all the goings-ons of Hunts Point and the change that we've seen in the past and our, our future coming forward. So <coughs> it just um, makes me that much more excited to be a part of this of this group and this project. So um, good afternoon. And I speak to you today on behalf of the Point Community Development Corporation to voice my support for the Peninsula Mixed Use Development Project. The Point is, Hunts, is a Hunts Point-based nonprofit that was founded in 1994. Our principal areas of focus are youth development, arts and culture, and community revitalization. Our work throughout the years has included advocating for environmental justice issues, such as open space and public access to our waterfront, creating an after-school program for, grade, for children grades one through seven, theater and dance performances, and an annual fish parade that showcases local artists as well as the community's new waterfront parks. The Point is proud to be a community partner in the peninsula with the Hudson com Companies, Gilbane Development Company, and Manny Management, Inc. The peninsula is a unique project on many levels. The non-traditional approach that, ha that this team has taken towards redeveloping the site takes into account the multiple needs of the Hunts Point community. Hunts Point is a community deeply in need of both affordable housing and living wage jobs. By creating approximately 740 units of 100% affordable housing and enabling long-time local food manufacturers to expand in new spaces at the peninsula ensures that the benefits of this development will be largely concentrated within Community Board 2. At a time when many people in the Bronx are concerned about gentrification and displacement of long-standing residents and institutions, this development leverages local assets and looks to local community partners to address the needs and concerns of the area. As one of those community partners, we have found the developers to be proactive and thoughtful in addressing community imperatives. Numerous public meetings have been convened to help update the, the neighborhood on project milestones, as well as workshops on HPD's affordable housing portal to ensure that community members are aware of requirements and are registered well in advance. As a partner, the point has been working to inform residents about the development and the steps they, they can take to improve their chances of qualifying for the HPD lottery. The point fully supports the Peninsula Project and its developers and looks forward to forging a model for mixed-use development that will be replicated in years to come. I also want to stress that the businesses that are coming to this, um, to this site are all basically Bronx-based businesses, which is something that I, I believe a lot of the other um, proposals were not able to do. And so that is very exciting. El Forno is already in Hunts Point. Bascom Catering is already in Hunts Point. The Ramirez brothers um, I'm a <laughs> have a, have, have a long-standing history in Hunts Point, and, um, and we look forward to expanding upon that, as well as they already um, hire local, so that's something that would also be expanded upon uh, with, their, with their own expansion. So that is something that's exciting and I think um, should be replicated in many other projects. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? No, see none. Uh, any uh, any other members in of the public? Yeah, you can leave. Uh, any other members of the public would like to testify? No, seeing none. I will now close the public hearing on pre-considered LU spot for campus with development. All the items in today's calendar are being laid over. I would like to thank the council and land use staff for preparing today's hearing and the members of the public and my colleagues for attending. This meeting is now adjourned. Oh, I missed.